Hey, this is Diego Ramos, and after a bit of a hiatus involving uh, unfortunate illnesses for each of the journalists for sale hosts, we're back, and with a massive guest, uh, my co-host Max Jones and I welcome former CIA analyst and uh, torture program whistleblower John Kiriakou. After a much-needed reminder of the history of the torture program, following the latest 9-11 anniversary on the Sheer Intelligence podcast, which we'll link below, uh, we wanted to ask John about the state of the media's uh, relationship with whistleblowers and taking the case of the Intercept's controversial handling of uh, multiple whistleblower accounts as a shining example of the eroding ethics and competence uh, of journalism within the United States. Uh, John takes us through his personal history with the media, shedding wisdom on where we're at in the grasp of the national security state and uh yeah and make sure to like comment and subscribe to help us fight the algorithm and enjoy hi john thanks so much for joining us happy to do it thanks for inviting me of course um so just to kind of start off maybe a little more broadly uh i kind of just want to get your read on the state of the media and the first amendment since it's clear that the media is compromised to an extent and there's a growing reliance of using the government as a source for information mm -hmm. about you know really important um, issues regarding war and, 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 you know, all, all types of very important, um, stuff. And there's a sort of a bigger trust as well in the government where, you know, you'll, you'll have outlets exclusively relying on, you know, anonymous sources and, and, and government officials. Um, but in general, do you feel like the media can still be a safe haven for whistleblowers and, sh or should other means of disclosing information be taken um, similar to maybe WikiLeaks is a system of anonymous of an anonymous Dropbox or any sort of kind of innovative way. Wow, that's a that's a good and powerful question. Actually, I'm glad that you started off with it because I think that you've cut right to the chase. So the the quick answer is um, looking at the media overall. I I do not think that the media in general can be trusted. Uh, especially with national security information. Um, you know, time was where, where you could go to the Washington Post or the New York Times or the Los Angeles Times and um, your identity would be protected while your information was being vetted. And if that information was determined to be in the national interest, it would be published, just like Daniel Ellsberg did, or just like um, the... Uh, the what do they what do we call them now the the burglars did uh with information related to the uh, Vietnam War and i'm sorry to say that we really can't do that anymore with the media for a variety of reasons uh, first of all many in the media are very very closely tied to the intelligence community and especially to the CIA now the CIA is forbidden by law from recruiting american journalists they have been since 1975, but they do the next best thing. They cultivate journalists by giving them proprietary leaks, um, not even to say that those leaks are necessarily true, but they're spun as being true. So they have preferred journalists that they go to. Uh, one that immediately comes to mind is David Ignatius at the, uh, at the Washington Post. Another is Ken Delanian at NBC News, and we can talk about him uh, in more uh, depth later. He, he's formerly of the Los Angeles Times. And, uh, you know, this the CIA will give them a story, will give them uh, a leak. In some cases, will give them access to classified information, knowing that they're going to spin it in a pro-CIA way and get the CIA's side of the story out there. That's an authorized leak. That is just as illegal as an unauthorized leak, of course. But it's never, ever prosecuted because it's official. It's an official leak. As if that weren't bad enough, you've got situations like, well, let's say the situation at The Intercept. You know, The Intercept was supposed to be sort of a back to basics, independent, investigative outlet uh, that was not, uh, was not in the pay of any organization, that didn't owe any favors to anybody and could be truly independent. And if anything, the reverse of that is true. The, the Intercept might be independent. Maybe, maybe not. Um, I, I tweeted something a couple of years ago, and I meant it literally. I said, I tweeted at the Intercept, 
And I said something like, are you guys really that stupid or are you in the pay of the FBI? Serious question, I said. Because in my view, nobody could be as stupid when it comes to national security whistleblowing as The Intercept has been. And what I mean is this. Uh, the Intercept has been responsible. The Intercept or, or journalists from The Intercept have been responsible for putting five national security whistleblowers in prison. And I'll give you just a couple of examples. Uh, one was Reality Winner. Reality Winner was a, a skilled linguist at NSA. She was a member of the U.S. Air Force. And uh, she believed that she had uncovered evidence that, um, that Donald Trump had been duped by the Russian government in the run-up to the 2016 election. Whether that was true or not is irrelevant for this story. What's relevant was she came across uh, uh, an analytic product written by NSA, classified at the secret level. So there were no sources and methods in it, but it was classified. She believed that it proved that, that Donald Trump had committed a crime. And her chain of command wouldn't do anything about it. So she, on her own, took this document and she sent it to uh, The Intercept using their encryption key that they had on their website. Now, this went to two journalists at The Intercept, two journalists who bill themselves as national security specialists. One was Matthew Cole and the other was Richard Esposito. Um, what did they do with that classified document? They immediately emailed it back to NSA and said, hey, we just received this. Can you confirm that it's an actual NSA document? Now, if you are a national security journalist, you would know, of course, that anytime somebody from NSA, CIA, FBI, or a handful of other national security organizations prints a document, your employee identification number is embedded in the document, in the period at the end of a sentence or in the dot of an I, right? It'll say, John Kiriak to 2168991, in a period at the end of a sentence. You can't see it unless you look at it on a microscope. But they sent this document back to NSA. They immediately identified the source as reality winner. They waited until the intercept published the piece, and 40 minutes after they published the article, Reality Winner was under arrest and charged with espionage. Now, The Intercept did the exact same thing with an FBI agent from the FBI's uh, Minneapolis field office. He had, he had come across an FBI, an internal FBI memo uh, that admitted that the FBI was probably guilty of racism in promotions. What he did is he took out his cell phone and he took a photograph of the memo on his screen and sent it to The Intercept. The Intercept sent it back to the FBI. Hey, is this an actual FBI uh, memo? They could tell from the picture that The Intercept had sent them that it was a photograph of the memo taken from the screen of a computer. So what was they that did, the same? Was were those the same journalists? Same two journalists. Oh, same two. Oh, wow. same two journalists: Matthew Cole and Richard Esposito. So what they did was they went back and looked at the security camera footage from every uh, computer that had accessed the memo, and they identified FBI agent Terry Albury as the person who had taken the picture, and they arrested him. They charged him with espionage. And they sent him to prison for three and a half years. Now, Matthew Cole, in my own case, um, sent me an email one day. And he said, here are a dozen names. I'm writing a book about the Abu Omar rendition from Milan. It was a kidnapping that the CIA carried out in Milan. Can you introduce me to any of these 12 people so that I can interview them for my book? I said, I don't have any idea who these people are. So he sent me a second list of another 12 names. And I said, look, you obviously know this issue far better than I do. I never had anything to do with kidnappings. 
I don't know anything about the Abu Omar operation. And he said, well, what about this guy that you mentioned on page, whatever it was, 125 of your book? I think his name is John. And I said, oh, that's John Doe. I don't know whatever happened to him. He's probably retired and living in Virginia somewhere. As it turned out, Matthew Cole was not writing a book about the Abu Omar rendition. That was a lie. He was secretly working for the Guantanamo defense attorneys. So he took my confirmation of John Doe's name and sent it to an investigator for Human Rights Watch, who in turn sent it to the Guantanamo defense attorneys, who in turn put it in a classified filing saying, we've identified a CIA officer by the name of John Doe and we want to interview him. <clears throat> Excuse me. We want to interview him. The judge recognized the fact that this name was classified. He turned it over to the FBI and the FBI went back to Human Rights Watch and said, where'd you get this name? And Human Rights Watch said, we got it from Matthew Cole. He's one of our investigators. They went to Matthew Cole and said, where'd you get this name? And Matthew Cole said, John Kiriakou gave it to me. So two dozen FBI agents raided my house, arrested me, and charged me with five felonies, including three counts of espionage. So you tell me, are they just that stupid or are they working with the FBI? Yeah, and the thing that's uh, particularly suspicious about the reality winner case is that uh, it the documents that leaked that didn't provide evidence that there was Russian hacking um, were also in the benefit of the national security state. Uh, that was disseminating a lot of the lies that were uh, that were, they were saying that Russia was hacking the election and helping Donald Trump get put into office. And then it also was in the national security state's interest that reality winner goes to uh, prison after exactly. that, because now you scare away anyone that wants to uh, exactly. reveal any kind of truth. So right? look how many birds you've killed with that one stone. Mm -hmm. You've frightened away any other potential whistleblower, Right. You have damaged the credibility and campaign of Donald Trump, maybe. And you've perpetuated the lie that the intelligence community wants out there that the Russians have successfully interfered in our election. It was perfect if you're the CIA. It was a perfect operation. And reality yeah. winner for that, that one, that momentary lapse in judgment got five years and four months in prison. Draconian. Yeah, yeah absolutely. And, and it leads to my next question, which is, um, and I think we've, I think we've kind of already answered it, but I guess I'll ask you directly, but so it's pretty clear, but I'll ask, but do you think there's an effort from the national security state to basically make the media, uh, you know, a minefield that's almost impossible to navigate when you have these institutions like the intercept that brand themselves on being, you know, uh, for whistleblowers, uh, where it's a minefield for whistleblowers to walk through. And like, you know, even during Ellsberg's time, I think the, the New York times kind of betrayed him in a way because they started reporting some of the stories that were uh, smearing him. Yeah. But, you know, when you have an institution like the intercept, which you just laid out, it's either, co-opted or it's or these guys are just somehow the dumbest people to ever live right yeah. um so how much worse has it gotten and what does it say about the oh, goals yeah. of the national security state another great question thank you for that so let me answer it in two ways number one um let's talk about ken delanian in answer to your question ken delanian was a uh was a national security journalist for the Los Angeles Times. He then went to NBC News as the chief national security journalist um, for NBC and MSNBC. Okay, with that in mind, uh, there is another journalist for Bloomberg, Jason Leopold. Jason Leopold is the king of the Freedom of Information Act. Uh, in fact, a Pentagon spokesman called him a FOIA terrorist because he's filed so many Freedom of Information Act requests more than anybody else on earth except the New York Times as an organization. It's incredible. And he, he's a sole practitioner for Bloomberg. He's the one who broke the, uh, the Hillary Clinton email story based solely on FOIA. 
So Jason Leopold requested yeah, on a slow day one day, he had nothing else to do. So he thought, oh, I'm just going to, I'm going to do a FOIA request to the CIA for all correspondence between the CIA's Office of Public Affairs and any national security journalist. Okay, most of it was garbage. But what he found was a series of emails between Ken Delanian and the CIA, where Ken Delanian was sending his stories to the CIA for clearance before he was sending them to his own editors. And the CIA was saying, hey, Ken, in uh, para paragraph two, uh, third sentence, we don't like that. Take that out. Uh, in paragraph six, we prefer if you say this or use this language. So is Ken Delanian reporting on the intelligence community or is the intelligence community feeding propaganda to Ken Delanian for him to repeat on NBC and MSNBC to the American people? Disgraceful. Disgraceful. Another thing that Jason Leopold found in this Freedom of Information Act request was any time a journalist was writing something that the CIA didn't like, something that was not complimentary of the CIA, and would send it to the CIA for comment, right, which the CIA never does, they never, ever, ever have a comment, um, and, but you have to do it, it's the protocol, they would respond by saying, if you publish this, you will be cut off and you will not be invited to the CIA Christmas party. <laughs> Seriously. <laughs> and they would back off. Wow. So they don't need to recruit American journalists. There's no reason to recruit them. You control them anyway. You control them by threatening them on the one hand or by feeding them the information that you want to leak, a la Kendallanian, on the other. Um, yeah. I have a I have a question on something that you mentioned on on our boss's Robert Shears uh, podcast not too long ago. People should definitely check that out. Um, that John Brennan went after you and through uh, Attorney General Eric Holder for espionage charges, right? Mm -hmm. um, despite Holder's uh, hesitance, and they made you defend yourself and essentially bankrupt yourself in, in doing so. So do you read this as a means of making an example of your of you and, you know, despite their, you know, uh, hesitancy to, to really go after this in court, um, they still found some sort of way to, you know, exploit any avenue to, to destroy you? Oh, absolutely. And and I know that I know that for two different reasons. Number one, um, a reporter for The New York Times told me. Well, a reporter for the New York Times wrote me a letter in prison, and he said he just felt awful about what had happened, and could he come and visit me? And I said, sure. I said, listen, no hard feelings. I'm a big boy. I knew what I was getting into. There's nothing that the New York Times could do to, to save me, right? So he came to visit me, and, and he said he wanted to apologize face to face. I said, not a problem. And he said, you know this was not really about you, right? And I said, well, what do you mean? And he said, the day that you were arrested, every national security source that the New York Times had went silent for six months. And he said, that was the point. The point wasn't a long sentence for John Kiriakou. He said, they didn't care how long your sentence was. The point was to silence anybody else who might be considering blowing the whistle on waste, fraud, abuse, or illegality. It was to frighten everybody. Look what we did to this guy. We ruined him. We drove him to bankruptcy. We confiscated his federal pension. Do you want the same thing to happen to you? No? Then keep your mouth shut. That was number one. Number two, one of my attorneys, my lead attorney, said the same thing. He said, this case really isn't about John Kiriakou. This case is about whistleblowing, and it's about the lack of whistleblower protections for national security whistleblowers. We have a Whistleblower Protection Act in the United States, but national security employees are exempt from its protections. So if you work for the Department of Agriculture or the EPA or the Department of Labor, you can blow the whistle to your heart's content. 
God bless. Maybe you're going to be on the cover of Time magazine. If you work for the CIA, the NSA, FBI, DOD, you're going to go straight to prison, and you're probably going to stay there for quite some time. Yeah. Um, and, you know, when we look at the – if we go back to the intercept for a second, when we look at the intercepts staff, some of, some of the staff, like Matthew Cole and Richard Esposito – and you, and when you think of Pierre Omidyar, who's, you know, a huge funder of regime change operations for the national security state and knowing what Matthew Cole did to you and what Richard Esposito's uh, association with um, the police. Right. And, uh, you, you know, like when you think about all these variables, um, what does it like, you know, because there, but there's also some journalists that I respect at the uh, at that, that were at the founding of the Intercept. But like, it's it's kind of a crazy scenario for me to think about because it's just such a complex kind of form of uh, information warfare and a psychological operation, I guess, in a way. And like, if if that's what it is, and and you know, what do you what is your personal opinion on that? If we could, if we could ask, like on Pierre Omidyar's involvement yeah. and the hiring of these guys that consistently are ratting on, uh, their, on, on their sources and locking them up. Um, what does that say about that institution and the role that it really was serving maybe from the beginning? You know, there was such hope and such promise when Pierre Omidyar first announced that he was going to create something called The Intercept. I remember... I remember so many like real go-getter independent journalists that I knew and how excited they were to to try to find work at the intercept. You know, cuz this was this was going to be the first truly well-funded outlet that was independent of the long arm of the CIA. And you know, it's it's laughable now in retrospect to look back and to think that that you know, that, that there was even a possibility that that could be the case. Uh, Pierre Omidyar, of course, being the multi-billionaire founder of eBay, uh, had a lot of people fooled for a long time that he was interested in transparency and honesty and independence uh, in the media. You know, protection of our First Amendment rights, for example. Uh, that was a joke. When you're funding the National Endowment for Democracy... Uh, for example, or the Atlantic Council, or the German Marshall Fund, you're you're no friend of transparency. You're no friend of of peace, or openness in in government. It's just a bad joke. And then when the intercept when the intercept starts um, starts hiring the likes of of Rich Esposito and Matthew Cole, who I would add in my indictment are listed as. Um, journalist A and journalist B, uh, you know you're in trouble. You know when I when I uh, got home from prison in 2015, I got an invitation from Jeremy Scahill, the editor in chief of of the uh, Intercept, to go up to New York and to be on his podcast. And I like Jeremy; he's a nice guy. I disagree with him on a lot of things, but he's a nice guy. So I said yes, I'd be happy to do it. I take the train up to New York. And he's waiting for me at the, inter at the Intercept's uh, entrance. And I go in, and I, I had met him several times before. So I said, Jeremy, before we get started, I got to ask you. I said, Matthew fucking Cole? Are you kidding me? And he goes, oh, I know, I know. You guys don't see eye to eye on things. I said, no, it's not that we don't <laughs> see eye to eye. It's that he's single-handedly responsible for putting me in a federal prison. That's my beef with Matthew Cole. And I said, Rich Esposito, listen, I'm the first to admit, Rich Esposito was my best friend. But Rich Esposito always wanted to be a cop. From when he had his first journalistic assignment as the midnight shift uh, crime blotter cop for the whatever it was called, the New York Daily News, until he became the deputy commissioner for public affairs. He always wanted to be a cop. Like, those are the best journalists that you could find for The Intercept? Seriously? And he's like, well, you know, that's just the way it is. I'm like, okay. 
Next thing you know, Reality Winner goes to prison. Terry Albury goes to prison. Daniel Hale, the drone whistleblower. Okay, let's talk about Daniel Hale for a second. Yeah, wasn't that Scahill? That was Scahill. Here you've got a guy who's telling you top secret information about the American drone program and how 80% of the victims of the drone program are civilians and most of them are women and children. So this is like top secret uh, targeting information. And Jeremy Heath Scahill says, hey, listen, uh, Daniel, uh, I'm going to do this documentary. Why don't you appear on the documentary with me and out yourself as the source of our, our stories on, on the drone program? Well, Daniel never worked with journalists before. He didn't know any better. And so he allows himself to appear in this documentary. Next thing you know, the FBI is breaking down his door, putting cuffs on him. It's like, way to protect your sources there, Jeremy. Good job. <laughs> Yeah, that's, uh, that's pretty amazing. Um, and it's just like, it's just like source after source after source, same story. Um, oh, yeah. And then Omidyar's attachment to it just makes it all the more suspect. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and look at it this way too. How many of these, these guys, these billionaires, let's use Jeff Bezos as, as the most obvious example. Jeff Bezos, democracy dies in darkness. Now it says on the front page of the Washington Post which he purchased. But he also does $400 million a year in business with the CIA, providing uh, classified uh, cloud space. So mm. how, how do you separate the two? Either you're going to report honestly about the CIA and the crimes that the CIA is committing, or you're going to take the CIA's blood-soaked money and put it in your pocket. Because it shouldn't be both. And it is both. Is Pierre Omidyar doing the same thing? I don't know, but I think it's a question that he needs to answer. Yeah, it, it seems like a lot of these guys and these intelligence agencies um, have like a false sense of self, this re- this uh, personality that they kind of project onto, uh, or that they project to convey themselves as m- these good people, right? Like uh, Bezos is like a liberal guy that, you know, has a liberal news outlet that the slogan is democracy dies in darkness, but then you're a CIA contractor. Uh, and, and that's the part you don't talk about, right? It's kind of reminds me of um, like the, the big tech people that do ayahuasca and then they're working for Palantir or something like that. Oh my God. Um, that's a great <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it, it's pretty brilliant. Um, but uh, yeah. And, and, and then the other thing about the, another thing about the intercept that is very strange is that they got a hold of the Snowden archive and um and then now that they I think they axed their research department right and um which is the which is the and they said it was for budgetary reasons which I don't know how true that is or what but uh either way now the Snowden archive is in the hands of Pierre Omidyar this guy that again is funding regime change operations uh, and works closely with the intelligence agencies. And he's the guy that owns it and no one's looking at it. No one's putting it out there. And it's just, it's just um, extremely damaging. And it was a pretty, you know, when you look at it from the, from the perspective of this, like how many whistleblowers it busted, how it privatized the ownership of the Snowden archive, it makes the, the intercept was a huge success in terms of uh, what it was actually probably meant to do, right? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And I'll tell you, not a day goes by now that I don't get at least four fundraising emails from The Intercept every day, <laughs> every single day. Like, please just send us $5. Please, we can't make it. Why? Because your billionaire founder won't write you another check? I mean, what is this? I, I just don't understand their their business model. I don't understand their ethics. And I don't understand if they've ever really been serious about their commitment to, to true transparent journalism, I highly doubt it. Yeah. And, yeah. you know, you know, talking about this incompetence from these reporters and stuff, I can't help but see the parallels in, in my own experiences uh, with, with journalism school. You know, I actually studied journalism. I don't know about these guys if they actually did, but, <clears throat> you know, and you've spoken in Bob's classes at, at USC and I, I 
I don't want to talk too much shit about my alma mater, but at the same time, you know, studying journalism, <clears throat> you would expect there to be some sort of actual teaching of of these core principles and and including this kind of thing, source protection, all right. this kind of stuff. And right. I never I never had any classes that dealt oh, with that. Oh, that's fascinating. Had. Yeah, and you know, and, I think Bob yeah. Shear would tell you too. Well, I know for a fact that he would because I've heard him say it. Um, the Annenberg School of Journalism is supposed to be one of the, the greatest journalism uh, schools in America, if not in the world. Right. They're not teaching you journalistic ethics. And there should be a standalone class on journalistic ethics, right? Absolutely. Because sometimes ethics aren't clear cut. There are, there are moral calls that you need to make. Um, and then this is the same school that goes and hires uh, David Petraeus, of all people to be a lecturer, like not in a, not a lecturer in the school of, you know, whatever military studies or intelligence community studies. I'm making those up, of course, <laughs> but in the school of journalism, seriously, you're going to, you're going to name the former director of the CIA, a <laughs> four star general who, who is a convicted criminal for lying to the FBI, Right. Cheated on his wife, so even his wife can't trust him. I don't know how the country can trust him. And that's the guy who's going to help teach you journalism. That's just grand. Yeah, yeah I guess they were on the trend of um, hiring spooks to be doing journalism even before yeah. MSNBC and CNN, right? Exactly. Yeah. Are you going to say it, something, Diego? Sorry. Yeah, I think, I think it just lends itself to a general erosion of ethics. And, and I think it is purposeful in a way where you have – people like uh, Ken uh, Delanian, right? And and all these people who, you know, I, I mean, I don't know what's what's going on in his brain, but I'm sure all these kind of reporters at the New York Times or, or whatever who accept information from direct uh, officials, they probably think they're doing the right thing. And they probably think they're, they're helping their country and they're reporting as honestly as they can in the name of uh, combating this information. All, all these kind of things that get in the way of, of actual truth, you know, and right. it's it's yeah it's just it, i think what happened at the intercept and what continues to happen to whistleblowers is just a, a, a perfect case study of of how journalism is just going down the drain i would agree with that very strongly and i would also agree with you very strongly that this is something that needs to be addressed at places like usc or columbia or georgetown or princeton where where schools are turning out young journalists who are going to be the future of journalism. You know, you've got to have this instilled in you from the very beginning. Because, listen, it's the same thing with the CIA, joining the CIA. You're not going to be taught ethics at the CIA. You have to go into your CIA career with your own ethical principles already in place your own moral uh, moral guidelines, a part of your life. You know, I have this standard speech that I give uh, at universities, and I use a, a hypothetical situation. And I say, imagine you are a CIA case officer, and you've recruited a bona fide terrorist. Let's say a member of Al-Qaeda or ISIS or Hezbollah, a, a true terrorist. And this guy has given you information that is gold. And you've used this information to disrupt terrorist attacks and to save American lives. Okay. So you're going to meet with him at a hotel somewhere in the Middle East, wherever you want, Amman, Cairo, wherever. And you go into the meeting and he says to you, you know what? I've been good to you and I've given you everything you asked for. And so Tonight, you're going to do something for me. I'm not going to give you any more information until you get me a prostitute. So do you get him the prostitute? Yes or no? And I ask for a show of hands. And usually about 75% of the hands go up. And I say, yes, you get him the prostitute. You know, this is kind of the, the ugly part of the job, but this is what you're trained to do. You need to make your source happy, keep your source happy so that he continues to give you information. So yes. It might be, um, you know, not the nicest thing you've ever done, but you would get the guy a prostitute. I said, what if he asks you 
for a child prostitute, then what do you do? And usually people kind of look around and maybe 10% of the hands will gingerly go up. And then I say, absolutely not. Absolutely not. You have to draw the line somewhere. But the thing is, you're not going to be taught this at the CIA. You have to go in there with a sense of right and wrong. And you tell this guy, I will not be party to a child crime. I will not do it. I will not victimize a child for you. If you don't want to work with me anymore, then you don't have to work with me anymore. I think that we have this relationship because we're saving lives and I'm paying you handsomely, but I'm not going to victimize a child for you. Again, the point being, headquarters isn't going to tell you what to do, right? The desk that's following your operations, they're not going to tell you what to do. And there's no written rule where you can look into the CIA rule book and say, oh, no, rule number 16.3.1 says, no, I can't get you a child prostitute. That's, that's, not, that's not real life. It's not how it works. Well, it's the same thing in journalism. You have to go into this with your own set of moral values, your own ethical construct that's, that's already a part of you. You know, a, an Israeli psychologist uh, and author once told me, he, he wrote a book about whistleblowing called uh, Beautiful Souls. His name is A.L. Press. He said one of the things that he found in psychology was that whistleblowers have a, an unusually highly defined sense of right and wrong, far more highly defined than the, uh, than the general public. But the same is true among journalists. Hmm. Now, sometimes those journalists lose their sense of right and wrong in pursuit of a story or even worse, in pursuit of a relationship with an organization like the CIA. And the key then is, is not to lose that sense of right and wrong. Yeah. And, you know, about how that, uh, that emphasizing that is completely absent in any journalism school. I mean, one of the things that Diego and I used to talk about when we were at USC um, a lot, and we still talk about it sometimes, was that no one in our school and I'm not exaggerating. Like I, I think I maybe met like one, one or two people that knew who Julian Assange was Ugh. at apparently the best journalism school in the in the world or the country. I don't remember what they say it is, but um, no one knew, and no one really cared either. And uh, I remember like the one. So we were having a discussion in class one time, and I think that this kind of encapsulates like that theme that you were talking about of like you know, do you let your sense of what's right and wrong guide the kind of reporting that you do or some other kind of external factor? And the, the conversation was about, um, there were these, uh, I guess there was these guys that in, in World War II Germany reported on like the crimes of the, of the uh, Nazi soldiers. Um, and not that many people read it because it was extremely censored. And, uh, and the, the, the professor asked us something like, uh, you know, is it worth it to do this kind of like courageous reporting if people aren't going to read it because, you, you know, power will not permit it to be read? And I said, and I raised my hand and I said, yeah, absolutely. I mean, like, you know, for the sake of the historical record and also for the sake of like being guided by what you believe is newsworthy and important for people to read, e right. even if you're fighting an uphill battle to get people to read it, it is important. And I said, and I said, you know, I think that one example of a reporter that has done some courageous reporting that many people don't know about now because of his courageous reporting and because of how much he's been censored and smeared by the mainstream media and the political class is Julian Assange. And without yeah. him, we wouldn't know. Yeah. We wouldn't know all these things about, uh, you know, the Bush, crime, the Bush's war crimes in Iraq and how they were bombing. I, I mean, I mean that, that, that infamous footage where they bomb, these guys, this group of civilians, and then they kill the first responders while yes. there were children in the van. Collateral and murder. yeah, and just to, and just to, and just to demonstrate how unconcerned journalism school professors are with that kind of thinking, the, the professor told me, "Well, it's hard for me to really care what happens to Julian Assange because he's so damn unlikable." Yeah, he says he this is. in front of a. <laughs> he is. Listen, I know Julian very, very well. Um. And he 
can be difficult and unlikable. And that is utterly irrelevant to the situation. I was yeah, on a exactly. panel uh, about a year ago with, uh, with two former journalists from Knight Ritter. And a member of the audience asked them why they and other members of the mainstream media, especially the, the Post, the Times, and the Journal, would not come out in, in defense of Julian Assange. And without missing a beat, one of these journalists said, I don't consider Julian Assange to be a journalist. I consider him to be an activist. And the, the audience member said, but the Post, the Times, the Journal, and everybody else um, have based articles on Julian Assange's information. And so even if you don't consider him to be a journalist, you have to acknowledge that he's at least a publisher. And they were like, next question, please. <laughs> and that was it. That was the end of it. It was shocking. Yeah. Yeah, crazy. Crazy. Diego, do you have another question before we do the last question? Uh, no, I think, I think that's a good segue um, to get into that. Okay, yeah. So, um, so uh, Diego and I have been having these discussions uh, lately about truth and the value of truth, and you know uh, what, like at the times that people you know hold it back, and also uh, talking about journalists and like when you know maybe people hold back the truth on some issue that they know is controversial, so that they can talk about another tr to the truth about another issue later, and this kind of like constant battle that we're fighting between um, authenticity and risking ourselves in the process. And I think that like whistleblowers are such a great um, example of this kind of like spiritual or physical philosophical kind of battle that I think that humans are facing, especially in the fields, uh, in the field of journalism. And, um, you know, like there's this, I, I write fiction a lot and there's this saying uh, that a character doesn't change until it becomes less painful for him to change than to remain the same. Oh, and I think that the- Interesting, yes. Yeah, and I think that the true, it's also true of, of real people, not just characters. And um, I, I, I wanted to ask you, like, you know, like yourself and other whistleblowers, they do this thing that's like seemingly kind of irrational by every measure, right? You know, once you blow the whistle, you're going to like face, serious physical consequences. You might put your loved ones in danger. You're putting yourself in danger. You're putting your career in danger. You're putting every material attachment that you have on the line because for some reason it's more, I, I, I would think that it's more painful inside to bear that truth any longer than to like let it out and to, and to, and to just face the consequences. So like, you know, as someone who blew the whistle and you seriously paid the price for it, how do you make sense of that battle? Like what, what point, is it that that becomes more painful than prison or, or all these other consequences that whistle blowing the whistle can put on someone? Yeah. Yeah. You know, I never considered myself ever in my life over the course of my life. I never considered myself as a, uh, as a boat rocker. Never. Um, even at the CIA, I did what I was told and I did it with a smile on my face until it came to the post nine 11 era and human rights abuses. These, these um, programs, whether it was torture or secret prisons or extraordinary renditions, were so obviously wrong. Like, I couldn't see any upside over the long term to doing any of these things. These were so obviously crimes against humanity that I remember thinking to myself, are my children and grandchildren gonna be proud of me? I mean, there, there are generations that haven't been born yet, grandchildren, great-grandchildren, you know, when I'm dead and gone, are they gonna be proud of me and what I did? I wanna leave a legacy for them. Yeah, you know, I'm, I'm proud of the, of the people that my parents were and my grandparents, I'm proud of them. And they were just working people. You know, they never really did anything that was historically noteworthy, but they were good people, good, moral, ethical, upstanding people. And I'm proud of them. And I want my kids and grandchildren to be proud of me. Now, I found myself at the CIA in this historic situation. So it's not just like, 
oh, was dad a good guy? Yeah, dad was a good guy. He was always honest and he was kind to, you know, strangers and the poor and children and, and small animals. I, was I kind to people who were accused of committing terrorism? Maybe that's not the right question. Maybe the question is, was I true to the Constitution? Was I true to the oath that I took on my first day in the CIA when I raised my right hand and I swore to uphold and protect and defend the Constitution of the United States against all enemies, foreign and domestic? I hate to think that in the room that day, I was the only one of the 300 who took that oath who actually meant it. But I thought, you know, this is going, this is, this is going to be a life decision and I've got to do the right thing. To tell you the truth, I, I barely remember being in prison. It was just such a, a short little uh, period of my life. It was 23 easy months. It was a decade ago. I don't even think about it anymore. Um, but I can sleep at night and my kids are proud of me. And I'll tell you a follow on to that. My, my third son, just started college last month as a freshman. And he called me on his first day of class. And he was very excited. And he said, Dad, you're never going to believe. I just walked out of my first ever ethics class. And I interrupted him and I was like, ah, oh, I hated my ethics class. It was all philosophy and these German philosophers I never heard of and never cared about. And he's like, no, 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 wait a minute. He said, I'm telling you, I just walked out of my first ever ethics class and the professor was talking about ethics in wartime. And he said, there are 300 kids in this class. It's in this giant auditorium. And the professor said, there's this guy, John Kiriakou. He was with the CIA and he couldn't remain silent when he saw the torture program and he went to prison because he blew the whistle on it. And he said, I wanted to shout, that's my dad. And I said, you see, Max, his, and my son's name is Max too. I said, you see, oh, yeah. Max, it, it's all worth it. It's all worth it. That made it worth it. You know, yeah. the, the night before I went to prison, uh, Jose Rodriguez, the former deputy director of the CIA tweeted at me. And all he said was, um, don't drop the soap, asshole. And I gave myself a few hours to calm down, take it easy. And I tweeted back and I said, Jose, I am on the right side of history and you are not. And I left it at that. Now, here we are 12 years later, almost. And he's going to go down in history as a torturer as a murderer, when his obituary is written, it's going to say that he was the godfather of the torture program. He murdered untold people, innocent people. He ordered innocent people to be kidnapped and sent to third countries to be tortured there. Some of them never made it out alive. I'd rather be John Kiriakou than to be that guy. Yeah, me too. <laughs> yeah, me three. <laughs> well, um, I think, uh, did you yeah. want to ask another question, Max? No, no. Uh, I think that's a great place to wrap it up. Unless you had something to say, Diego. Uh, no, yeah, no. That was that was amazing. Thank you, John, so much for for coming on and talking. Thank to you, us. guys. Listen, these were these were among the best questions anybody has asked me in one setting. Kudos. Wow. Thank, thank that. you. That means a lot coming from you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Absolutely. Great. Good to see you both. Good yeah, to see you. Too.